I love that song. <laughs> and straight up, I just love that song. That is worship. And uh, if you're too narrow-minded and can't think that way, I'm sorry about that. Um, wow, I am pumped about today. Uh, and I know there's a lot of men that are pumped about today. Because today is Woman Sunday, and you got up this morning, and you said, we are going to church. And it might have been the first time you said that as a man. But you're like, you're going to sit there and take it, because I took it last week. And um, men, there's actually a couple things for you in the sermon today, too. And, um, and I ran into a man after that last service. He's like, why you always got to work in something for the man? And I was like, <laughs> so anyway, word to the men, man up, all right? If you are a woman... Uh, I don't know what it's like to be a woman. I've never been one. I'd make an ugly woman. And so I just want to challenge you um, to listen to today's message with an open heart and open mind. Uh, I'm going to do something last week we did for the men. uh, And I'm going to ask all the ladies in just a second to pray. And when we pray, ladies, all I'm going to ask you to do is to ask God to prepare your heart to hear this message and to speak to you what he needs to speak to you. Um, If you're here and you're a woman and you're married to a, a man... Maybe you, if you're the man, you should pray for your wife to be able to hear from the Lord. Uh, if you're a single girl, pray for God to speak to your heart. If you're a single dude, um, just pray that you'll get married, man, all right? And, and hope that works out for you. If I can get married, any of y'all can get married, all right? So let's pray, and we're going to jump right in. So bow your heads, and let's close our eyes, and just take a second to ask God to prepare your heart, and then we're going to jump right in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a Roman candle. And I figured since I was going to talk about women today, there's nothing better to start the sermon off with than the Roman candle, right, men? (laughs) Now, how you handle a Roman candle is incredibly important. Because most men in the room love Roman candles. Remember the bottle rocket wars we used to do, guys? Um, and, and like every once in a while you'd sneak a Roman candle in and boom, boom, you could chase your friends. You remember that? Wasn't that great? I uh, loved Roman candles. Now, here, there, there's, some, there's some instructions on a Roman candle. Have you ever read the instructions? Because if, if you read the instructions, it kind of protects you a little bit on certain things. Let me read you the instructions on a Roman candle. Warning. That's in red. Uh, do not hold in hand. Which all of you, if you're a man, you, you broke that because we hold these. And, and, and you got to understand, if you're in the South, we're Southern. Every holiday, we, we shoot fireworks. We blow up things in the South. That's what we do. We love destruction. And so we love, and so it doesn't matter. You, what, so Roman candles, sorry. Uh, do not hold in hand. Use only under close adult supervision. For outdoor use only. I'm so glad they put that one on here. Um, buried tube halfway in sand or soil and point away from people or flammable material. And once again, don't shoot this at the gas station this afternoon. Light fuse and get away. Now, there's a reason I would read these instructions because, see, if you read instructions on certain things, it protects you from making some pretty bad mistakes. My father, for example, and I, um, I, and I can't remember what the holiday was, but my dad, I was like eight years old, and he goes and he buys us a bunch of fireworks. And so we got all these fireworks out there, and it's really great. And he bought Roman candles. We, we, we weren't really sure what Roman candles did. Kind of confused about the whole Roman candle thing. And, and so my dad lit the Roman candle. I'll never forget this. He lights the Roman candle, and it starts going. And my dad doesn't know what to do. True story. So he takes the Roman candle, and he throws it in the air. Now... My grandmother, who was 80 years old, was there, and I got to see her sprint, and that was really cool. But this Roman candle was going through the air like this. It it caught our garden on fire. It caught, like our garden, we're like, that's a fire, and it's it's like burning. And and, and what I'm trying to say is that never would have happened had we followed the instructions given on a Roman candle, you know, put in the ground, light fuse, get away. That's the whole Roman, I'm going to set the Roman candle right here so we can... I'll kind of look at that throughout the sermon. Well, ladies, I want to talk to you today, and I want to talk to you about how special that you are. This is who the Bible says you are. This is, the Bible says you're special and you're unique. Did you know that? There, there, there's a comparison that goes on 
that the world will tell you that you're just kind of plain and ordinary, but the Bible says you're special. But most women, let's just be honest, we're going to put this one up for a second. Most women just kind of feel ordinary and plain in today's society. You don't feel special. You don't feel unique because you let the world define who you are rather than God defining who you are. The world, th- I mean, the, the, the Bible says that the, you're, you're created special, that this is who you are. And there's a lot of men going, <clears throat> my wife's the Roman candle, Perry, and short fuse and destruction. No, 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 hold on for a minute. You, you know, this is, you know, created special beautiful and 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 reality is this in the world that we live in and i've been in ministry now for um nearly 15 years and the one thing i know about um ladies or girls and and all the way middle school all the way up in their 50s 60s and 70s is most women do not feel beautiful and special most women that i know simply do not feel beautiful and most women that i know do not feel special and there's a reason why. Because, see, ladies, you, and, you were created to be an instrument that can hold the glory of God. So God can pour into you and you can hold the glory of God. And I will tell you exactly why most women in society today do not feel beautiful, do not feel special. It's because women have allowed the world to define who and what a woman is rather than Scripture. And you know what happens when you do that, ladies? You know what happens when you begin to let the world define who you are as a woman you isolate yourself from god and god wants to pour into you but he can't because you're isolated by the world and the world will kind of try to seal you off from god and define you as a woman and it's fun going along with the world isn't it this is the way some women feel your life is like a whirlwind and, and the world is just kind of taking you along on this journey, and the world is keeping you spinning around. But you know what the world will do to you eventually if you let the world define you as a woman? The world will eventually break you to pieces. The world will eventually destroy you. And reality is this this morning, that most women don't feel like that beautiful, special vase that God designed. Most women feel broken and shattered and worthless. So how do you not feel like that? Like ladies, my question is, is, is how do you not feel like that right there? How do you feel special? How do you feel, how do you feel valuable in a society that has told you that you're value less and worse, worth less? I think it's through asking a series of questions. If you have a Bible, we're gonna go to Ephesians chapter five, and I know there's some women going, hey, that boy's going to cut his feet on that glass. I got really thick shoes on, so calm down, all right, because women worry. Um, if you have a Bible, go to Ephesians chapter 5. That's where we were last week for the man. And we're going to talk about women. And ladies, I'm going to give you a series of questions that you can ask about yourself. Once again, this is not a series of questions you should ask, oh, I wish my sister were here. Well, you know, bring her back tonight or whatever. This isn't a series of questions for your sister or your friend. Ladies, this is a quest- series of questions that you can ask yourself. Whether you're married or whether you're single, these are questions I feel like that every woman should ask about herself, her marriage, her kid, her, you know, the, the biblical role of womanhood. And we're going to really dive into Scripture in Ephesians chapter 5. So um, let's ask ourselves the first question. Number one, am I careful? The first question I think ladies need to ask is am I careful? Now, Ephesians chapter 5 is where we get this. And I'll, let me kind of read some Scripture and explain it real quick. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 15. Look at this. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most, look at that, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Ladies, are you careful in your life and in your marriage to make the most of every opportunity? When it comes, listen, listen, oh, it's going to get tense. And I love tension. I just want to let y'all know straight up, I'm a preacher that just loves tension. Because when it's tense in the room, that means truth is being spoken. Somebody's going, ooh, ooh, ooh. So I love that, all right? I love tension. So when it gets tense, don't think, Perry's nervous. I'm not nervous. I get nervous when there's not tension. See, right there, there's tension. I love that. So anyway, ladies, I want to. Th- this is in regards to how you treat your husbands. Are you careful in regards to how you treat your husbands? And let me give you two follow-up questions. They're not going to come up on the, the screen, but you can kind of write these down if you want. 
You can determine whether or not you're a careful woman by asking yourself two questions in regards to how you treat your husband. Question number one is, how do I talk about him? Question number two is, how do I talk to him? How do I talk about him? And how do I talk to him? Because a woman who is broken and shattered and defined by the world will always speak about and to her husband in a negative way. Do you know that? I remember, I remember I planned this vacation one time, and Lucretia and I, Lucretia's my wife, for those of you who are visiting, she's my wife, she's hot and godly. Um, but Lucretia, my hot godly wife, and I go on vacation every year um, to Panama City Beach, Florida. How many have been to Panama City Beach, Florida? Isn't that a great place? Have y'all been to Angelo's Steakhouse? Is that not like, the, you know, the big cow right out in front? Great steak. Has nothing to do with God or Jesus, but I just wanted to say that. So anyway, so, so we love going to Panama City Beach, Florida. And, and it was really cool. We have a great time. Well, one year, we decided, you know, or I say we, I decided to go down there a little early. Um, we were going to go in March. And she said, well, you know, I remember us talking about it. And she said, well, I just don't know about, like, March and stuff, you know, because it's, it's kind of cold. And, and I was like, honey, 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 it's Florida. It's always hot in Florida, you know. We're just going to go. It's going to be fun. You'll see. And the, the, the day we pulled into Panama City Beach, Florida, it was so beautiful. It was in the 60s. And it was nice. And that night it clouded up and started raining. It rained for three days and never climbed out of the 40s. A little tension in the room. Oh, oh, oh wow, look at that. This is another rainstorm, and it's cold. And we all had, well, I mean, Lucretia and I had short sleeves. Neither one of us had long, we're freezing. And Pat, we cut the heat on. You know what I'm saying? And it was a little tense. I'm not going to lie, it was a little tense. But you know what my wife did not do to me? She did not come back and tell all her friends what a moron her husband was for taking us to Panama City Beach, Florida in March. You know what she did not do to me, ladies? The next time it came to plan a vacation, she didn't go, hey, vacation boy, come in here for a minute. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Would you like to go to Alaska and swim? You know, she didn't do that. It matters, ladies, how you talk to your husband and how you talk about your husband. Because, listen, how you talk to your husband and about your husband speaks volumes about your character. And you may think that you're feeling better by running him down. When in reality, if you're married to him, you're a partner and you're running yourself down as well. Do you know that? How do you talk about your husband? Now, 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 listen, listen, listen. Don't, but, 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 for getting your single friends together in a prayer group. Oh, come on now. That's how Christians do it. Pray for my husband. He's stupid. Yeah. You just... <laughs> how you talk about your husband. Because, listen, I know there's some bitter women in this church. Did you know that? You know how I know bitter women are in this church? I've read your emails that you sent my blog. <laughs> Tell my husband this. Tell my husband this. Tell my husband this. You know, you tell him. You married him. But tell him in love. You know what I'm saying? Stop being bitter. You know, yeah, you married the guy. And how you talk about him speaks volumes about your character. And don't tell me that women don't talk bad about their husbands because I've been in the gym before with my iPod on, but it's really off. Listen to women talk to each other. He just did this, and he just did this, and, then, and, then, and, then. and I hear it. I hear it. It's, it's, it's the most amazing thing ever. And you know what, ladies? Let me encourage you because a lot of ladies are like, I just need somebody to vent to. I just need somebody to vent to. It's not called venting. The Bible calls it gossip and goes on to say that it's a sin. And if you really want to talk to someone about your bad marriage, ladies, what you should do is seek the advice of an older, godly woman who has a good marriage and not some bitter woman who also has a bad marriage because two bitter women have never came up with a good solution for anything. Thelma and Louise. <laughs> it's your goal to drive off a cliff. You know, that's where, yeah, that's where it's going to go. 
how you speak about your husband. But Perry, you don't know my husband. He's an idiot. Yeah, yeah, most men are. I agree. We're, we're all, but listen, here's the deal. If there's a problem in the marriage, talk about it in the marriage. How you talk about your husband. How you talk to your husband. Oh, that is so important because, ladies, your husband can rise and fall on the words that you speak to him. And that is why most men in America would rather be at work and not at home. It's because of the way they're spoken to. Do you encourage your husband? Do you build him up? Or are or, or women, oh, that's good. Do you manipulate him with your tears? Sometimes I just lose control. I'm just the woman. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. If a man acts like that and loses control and screams and yells, you call it a sin. But if you do it, it's okay because you're a woman. So what you're seeking to do is justify your sinful behavior on the fact that God created you female. Somehow, that dog don't, won't hunt with God. Somehow, that's just not going to work. Well, I'm a woman. Well, you know what? If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You've got self-control. Learn how to exercise it when you're speaking to your husband. Uh, Are we okay? Looks of death this morning. I'm getting it. (laughs) Except the men. The men are sitting there going, amen. You know what I've know, you know what I've seen a hundred times since I've been in ministry? I'll see women begin to pray for their husbands, and God gets a hold of their husband and begins to do a really significant work in his life, and the woman will get bitter about the work that God is doing in the life of her husband because it affects her in a negative way. Let me explain it. There's a lot of women that I've seen it. Listen, I've seen it a hundred times. The woman takes the role of leadership in the home because the man won't do it, and the man begins to assume the leadership role in the home. And because the woman doesn't like how the home's going now, because the family actually goes to church instead of going on vacation 17 times a year, because they actually begin worshiping God with their money instead of just spending it however they want, the man will actually begin to fall in love with Jesus, and the woman gets bitter about it because things change, and she actually begins to tear her husband down with her words. I've seen it a hundred times. Women, are you sensitive? Let me just ask you a question, ladies. Are you sensitive to the work of God in your husband? Because you can always have the old man back. You can always have the man that was a pathetic wimp back. If you keep pushing him down with your words, he'll come back. Take Job, for example. You ever read Job? I feel sorry for Job. People have asked me before, do you read the book of Job a lot? No, I don't read the book of Job a lot. I get depressed. I mean, he lost his donkeys and his camels got killed like when your camels get killed yeah it's a bad day and all his friends were legalistic and they came and told him there's sin in your life when in actuality god was doing this amazing work behind the scene and and, and job lost his friends and he lost his family and he lost all the and he lost i mean everything everything got lost and in, in chapter two job gets real 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 sick and he begins to you know he's on his deathbed and i know men are babies when we're sick we get a paper cut and we're like oh uh, but, but, but the bible says job was like really 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 sick and in comes his wife mrs job now you would think that mrs job would be compassionate towards her husband wouldn't you think that I mean, I remember when I was sick and almost died, Lucretia was awesome. She took care of me. She brought me food. I mean, Lucretia took such good care of me. It was amazing. Mrs. Job comes in the room, and you would expect Mrs. Job to maybe encourage her husband or say, I'm praying for you. But this is what Mrs. Job said because the way that God was working in her husband began to affect her in a negative way. Mrs. Job said this in Job chapter 2, verse 9. She comes in the room. She said, his wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. A lot of men are like, it's my wife. How do you speak to your husband? Let me ask you a question. At the time, Job needed his wife the most. Was she there? No, because the work of God was affecting her in a negative way. She wanted Job out of the picture. How do you speak to your husband? How do you speak about your husband? Let me say this, and this is really this is really tense. There's some single moms here, and I understand he left. 
He took off. I understand that you think he's an insensitive, self-centered jerk. Probably is. But you know what? Your children can figure that out on their own. They don't need you telling them that information. And here's why. In children's ministry and youth ministry, I met four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds who knew way more about marital problems than they should have ever known at their, that age because the mother unloaded on them. If dad's a jerk, they'll figure it out. How do you speak to your husband? How do you speak about your husband? It says a lot, ladies, about if you're broken and shattered or not. Because a broken and shattered woman who is cut to pieces will also try to cut her husband to pieces. First question. Number two, am I knowledgeable? Am I knowledgeable? For most women, the answer there is, is yes. But let me, let me kind of explain. There, when it comes to the will of God, there are two parts of the will of God. There's God's general will, and then there's God's specific will. Let me explain. God's general will is for everyone in the room. There are certain things that you and I never need to pray about. It's God's general will. For example, God's general will for everyone in this room is um, not to go get in your car today and drive down a sidewalk and run over pedestrians. That's God's general will. Nobody even has to pray about that. You don't have to leave and go get in your car and go, God, do I run over people? I mean, you don't have to even pray. Things that are God's general will... You don't even have to pray about God's specific will would be like, I want you to have this job. I want you to go to this place. I want you to go to this school. I want you to have this major. God has a general will, and God has a specific will. And so I, I'm going to share with you what God's general will is, and I'm going to get into this, and it's going to get real tense for the ladies in this room. But ladies, I want you to take the foot off the brake for about five minutes and just listen to me. Look at this in verse 17. The Bible says this. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. In other words, there's some things about God's will that we need to understand. Now, ladies, where I'm going to go, some of you aren't going to like it. and It's going to get on your nerves for just a second. But I want you to stay with me because I'm going to read these passages and then I'm going to explain them in a way that maybe you've never heard them explained before. I love it. All right, here we go. Verse 22. I'm singing a lot this morning, am I not? God, I just want to be like Lee. Verse 22. Wives, submit to to your husbands as to the Lord. Let's stop. You feel it? This is this. Yeah, you feel that? You feel that? I, I do. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, I know what you're thinking, ladies. That was great 2,000 years ago. But this is like 2006. I don't have to submit to my husband. Well, let me, ladies, let me just kind of point about three things out about this passage before. Because a lot of ladies, and I've met a lot of ladies who try to argue with me and say, that passage is no longer applicable. Well, ladies, if you no longer have to submit to him, then he no longer has to love you as Christ loves the church. You see, the Bible is all-inclusive. The Bible isn't like going to Ryan's and getting the buffet. Ooh, I want some love like Christ loved the church and submission. Oh, no, 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 honey, we're not getting submission. That's just not good. Listen, you can't go through this book with a black highlighter and, and mark out the things you don't like. And so, ladies, if he has to love you as Christ loved the church, then Scripture says you have to submit to his leadership. Second thing, if this passage is no longer applicable, the second thing is that if the wife no longer has to submit to her husband, then the church no longer has to submit to Christ. And I started reading the book of Revelation this morning. The church belongs to him. And number three, I know a lot of women that go, well, it's a submission thing. It's just wrong. It's just, it's wrong. Because, and the reason it's wrong is because Christianity just devalues women. What? Christianity actually elevated. You understand, before Christianity, women, all you were was property. Christianity Jesus Christ is what confirmed your value to the entire world. I can give you a list of I can give you a list of religions that suppress the role of women, but Christianity wouldn't be one of them. Do you know Jesus first appeared? 
to a woman when he rose from the grave? Do you know that Jesus endorsed women in his, there were women who actually followed Jesus in ministry. We have people argue with us from, from, from time to time. Should women be in ministry? We've got women involved in ministry right here at New Spring Church that are following Jesus. So women, this does not suppress you. It actually elevates your worse, worth. Let me tell you three things about submission that you need to know. Letter A, it cannot be forced. Submission cannot be forced. Let me explain something to you about Lucretia, my wife. I could never force that woman to submit to me. She's from South Georgia. South Georgia women will mess you up. My wife is smarter than me. I mean, she, she was valedictorian of high school and college. I didn't even know what the valedictorian was in high school. I'm not making that up. It's just a kid I beat up all the time. I had no idea what valedictorian was. She's smarter than me. You've heard me say it before. She's a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. If I went home and announced, you are going to submit to me, she would mess my world up. <laughs> I come in tonight going, here's my teeth. We, I mean, Lucretia and I talk. I mean, it would just be bad. So I'm telling you, I could never force my wife, who's smarter than me, who could beat me up, and who's godlier than me, to submit to me. You say, Peter, why does she submit to you? It's very simple. She trusts me. She trusts me. Men, it's up to you and I to provide the trust level in our homes where our wife has no problems following our leadership. And most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, the reason some women have a problem with the submission thing is because they can't trust their husband. Here's the deal, ladies. You've got to pray to God. God, teach me to trust him. And then you've got to start trusting him now. I've met so many ladies that go, I'll trust him when he's trustworthy. No, 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 no. You trust him now and let God get to him. The, here's the thing, ladies. You've got to get out of the way and let God get to your husband. It's the best definition of submission I've ever heard. And the reason that God isn't doing the significant work in the life of many husbands all across America is because the wife is in the way. Move out of the way. Tell him, you're the leader. And women, you know, you, you don't want to be out of control. Just tell him, listen, you're the leader. I trust you. Make the decisions. And watch what happens. It's a matter of trust. Men, you can't go home today and go, I'm the leader. If you ever declare you're the leader, you're not. And I'll show you who the leader is. That's what's going to happen. So it, the letter B, it cannot be devalued. Submission cannot be devalued. Can't be. Women, let me, let me read this to you. I, I didn't do this in the first service, but I'm going to do it in this service. because so, Women, you're valuable. Did you know that? I want to read you this thing called um, apples. This is beautiful. I love this. This is great. It made my day. Women are like apples on trees. The best ones are at the top of the tree. Most men don't want to reach for the good ones because they're afraid of falling and getting hurt. So instead, they sometimes take the apples from the ground that aren't as good but easy to reach. The apples at the top think something is wrong with them, when in reality, they're amazing. They just have to wait for the right man to come along, the one who is brave enough to climb all the way to the top of the tree. Isn't that great? It goes on to say, now men, men are like fine wine. They begin as grapes, and it's up to women to stomp the crap out of them until... <laughs> Until they turn into something acceptable to have dinner with. Isn't that great? <laughs> I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> Women, you're valuable. You're valuable. See, a lot of people, when, they, when it comes to submission, they'll say, well, the wife, should, that, that, that devalues the woman. No, that increases your value. Women, you are valuable. It doesn't mean that you're not valuable to your husband. It simply means that in every system, if you read through Scripture, God is a God of order. There must be order and completion. And God said there must be order in the family. Just like there's order in the military, you've got generals and you've got captains and lieutenants and sergeants and privates. And they all go on the battlefield together. All of them are equally valuable. But somebody has to make the decision. There must be some element of authority or there's complete chaos. And the reason that there is complete chaos in a lot of families, like I said last week, is men won't step up and take that role 
But it's up to the man, ladies, to take the role of the authority. And it doesn't make you invaluable. It makes you, it makes you more valuable. Because you know why? When God holds your family accountable one day, and he will, he's going to hold the man accountable, not you. Submission is more of an act of protection than it is anything else. I mean, men, let me just tell you something. When I have to make decisions, I talk to my wife. Because many times what I've discovered is God will give my wife information and wisdom that he won't give me. And, it, and, it, and Lucretia and I have a partnership when it comes to making decisions. We make decisions together. I remember one time I wanted to buy a car. Um, Lucretia had first started, she, she started working. And I said, we're going to live on my salary. We're not going to use any of your salary. And she got her first paycheck. And I'd never seen that much money, you know, and I was like, it was more than my salary. And I was like, oh my gosh, we got to buy something. Uh, We should buy a car. And and because her car was horrible. And I was like, we need to buy you a car. Because in reality, it was a little selfishness because she was on call a lot and I wanted to buy her a Mustang and I figured I could drive it and um, it'd be great because I wouldn't want the car just to sit there. So I decided I would buy the car and I went to the hospital one night to talk to her about it because she was on call. We sat in the hospital cafeteria and I said, I think we need to buy this car. She's like, I just, I just don't think that's smart. And I was like, well, you know, I understand, but you know. And I laid out all these things, and she gave me 20 reasons as to why not to buy the car. And I was like, I still don't know. And then she said, well, Perry, if you really think that's what God wants us to do, buy the car. <laughs> Pull the God card on it. Pull the God I didn't buy the car. You know what? It was a very wise financial decision because I value the opinion of my wife. Women, you're valuable. Husbands, value the opinion of your wife. Number three, it is only for married couples. Submission is only for married couples. Notice the text does not say, girlfriends, submit to your boyfriends. And the reason I'm saying this, I really want to challenge and call out the single ladies. I am sick and tired of single girls who fall in love with a guy and begin to rearrange their life for him because they want him. The only type of woman that will do that is a woman that feels like she's not good enough to get anyone. I've seen it a hundred times. College girls, well, I had to rearrange my schedule. Why? Because my boyfriend doesn't want me to take that class. Tell him to jump off a cliff. I'll tell him to jump off a cliff. You don't have to submit to his authority because he, well, he might give me a ring. Yeah, he might give you an ulcer too. You know what I'm saying? I am sick and tired of seeing seeing single girls rearrange their life because they might have a possibility of marrying a guy someday. It bothers me. And it also bothers me when I see single girls lie to get to a guy. For example, oh, I love football. Oh, I love football. You want to go to a football game? Uh Uh-huh. You get to the football game, the girl's sitting there going, what's that thing? <laughs> that's a football. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I was talking about something else. Why do they have those little prisoners running around? Those are referees. Oh, okay. That's, didn't know. <laughs> be honest, ladies. Be honest. Number three, am I worshipful? Am I worshipful? And I love this because you talk about, am I worshipful? And this is where a lot of women go, oh, yes, yes, I do. I am. I'm so worshipful. I used to only raise one hand, but now I raise two because I love Jesus more. (laughs) Have you ever heard that? I I used to raise one hand, but now I raise two. (laughs) Stick your feet up and see what happens. You know what I'm saying? Verse 18 in Scripture says this. This is, this is for the women. Um, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. Now, ladies, there's a, there's a comparison and contrast in this verse, and I want you to, I want you to get this, ladies. It says, um, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. In other words, you put a lot of wine inside of you, what comes out of you is debauchery. If you've ever been at a party and you see a woman drink a lot, what comes out of her is not beautiful. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, listen, this is what the Bible says, I'm just going there. The woman that's always throwing up and running around the room with a lampshade on her head is not 
the kind of woman you want to bring home and introduce to your mother. But the Bible also says, um, uh, where did it go? You're in there. Stop. There we are. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. In other words, if the Holy Spirit indwells you, what comes out is songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. It comes from your heart, music to the Lord. And ladies, here's the danger. The, many ladies, even in this room, listen on the podcast or whatever, you've let the world define you as a woman. And if you let the world define you as a woman, you will always feel like you fall short. You will always feel like you're broken to pieces like this vase. You will always feel worthless. If you let the world define you as a woman, you cannot truly worship the Lord the way God created you to worship because you don't see yourself as valuable. I can describe every woman in this room in one, one word. Now, a lot of you are going, uh, oh, that's, you don't know my wife. She's complex. They're, I mean, we've never said one word, you know. I can describe every woman in this room in one word. I, it only takes one. doesn't take 50. doesn't take 100. doesn't take 10. I can describe every woman in this room one word. Are you ready? Tired. You know how I know that, ladies? It's because if you're tired... You've let the world define who you are. Let me show you why you're tired. You want to see why you're tired? You want to see why you're so worn out? Women in our society define themselves by five things. The first thing that women define themselves by is their appearance. And if you want to write these down, you can. But appearance. Women want to know, am I beautiful? There's not a woman in this room that would ever tell her husband, you bother me when you tell me you're beautiful. Stop it. You know, I, I, I want, would you tell me I'm ugly every once in a while? There's not a woman in this room that doesn't want to hear her husband say to her, you're beautiful. Not a woman. Not, not one. You don't even have to look. You know, husbands, you know, is that true? It's true. Your wife wants to know that she's beautiful to you. That's why women are, are so passionate about being beautiful. 99% of women in a recent survey said they would change one thing about their physical appearance if they could. And women... You are, you are in a no-win situation because you are up against supermodels who starve themselves and have the assistance of Adobe Photoshop on a computer to make themselves look that way, and then you're told you need to look that way, and you can't feel that way, and you don't feel valuable. You feel like that. Well, that's why women spend, I think it's like $30 billion a year on cosmetics. That's why you'll see more women going to a tanning bed than men. Nothing's wrong with a tanning bed, unless you have a tan in November. <coughs> Second thing women define themselves by is their kids. I've heard women say, I'm a horrible mother because. And you know what, women, you, you're, so goes the kid, so goes the mom. You ever notice that? Like a mom, your kid can be out in the tree, you're not even near, near your kid, kid falls out of the tree, breaks his arm, and you will feel like a horrible mother. I'm a horrible mother. I'm a horrible mother. You're not, you didn't get at the bottom of the tree and go, <laughs> like, that's a horrible mom. But you're inside, you know, chilling. And, and, and dads aren't like this. I talked to a dad one time on staff. He said, yeah, I got to go and take my kid to the emergency room. Why? I might have broke his arm. We don't know. But, but moms are like, oh, I'm a horrible mother. He fell out of the tree. I'm a horrible mother. All right? Third thing is their home. Women want a clean house. And, and, and here's the thing. I've been, it, it drives me crazy. You'll walk into a woman's house, you'll sit down, and she'll apologize 72 times for the house being so messy. Oh, I'm always so messy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just so, and I'm like, I could eat off your floor, lady. And no, 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 no. Oh, it's so messy. I'm sorry that pillow is not straight. Uh, and if women, let me just tell you something, man. If, if, if women don't feel like the house is clean, Things aren't right in their life. I talked to a guy on the phone the other day. He said, I'm stressed out. Why? My wife is always stressing about the house. I said, hire somebody to come in and help clean up the house. It's like, really? Would that work? I was like, yeah, hire somebody to come in and help clean up the house. He said, wait, I, I think I'm going to do that. He called me back. I'm not, and I don't ask for this. He called me back two weeks later. He said, dude, that was the most incredible thing in the world. My sex life has improved. I don't want to know that. There's a lot of men right here going, hire somebody and clean up today. Number four, relationships. Women want peace in the home, and there's some single girls here, and you define yourself by the relationship. If you have a relationship, life is great, and if you're not dating somebody, you feel like you're worthless. 
And it's getting to that time of year, ladies. Those of you that are single, you hate Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know why? Because you're going to go home, and you're going to hang out with a family, and they're going to say, have you found anybody yet? <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just look at them and go, no, don't be. I could have married what you got. <laughs> I'd rather be single. You've heard me say this before. I'm going to say it again. You know how to stop that, ladies? You know how to stop that? Because a lot of you ladies, especially ladies, you'll go to a wedding with your aunt and they'll go, you know, or your uncle, and they'll be like, hey, it's about time for you, isn't it? Hey, it's about time for you, isn't it? Hey, you're next, aren't you? Hey, what's your problem? It's about time to hurry this up. You know how to stop that? Next time you go to a funeral with them, <laughs> it's about time for you, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> you're next. <laughs> I, I just, but you know I'm telling the truth. There's a lot of single ladies in here. You define yourself by your relationships. And the last thing is career. Women define themselves by the career. They want things to be going right in the job and things like that. Now, I'm going to ask to keep this list up for just a second. Ladies, let's walk through this. Appearance, kids, home, relationship, career. You know the reason that you feel so tired? I'll tell you the reason you feel so tired. Because there will never be a point in your life when all five of these things are in complete order. If this defines who you are as a woman, if this list right here defines who you are as a woman, then you're never going to feel peace in your life. You're never going to feel security. You're never going to feel organized. You're always going to feel like things are out of order, and what comes out of you is not going to be good because you're going to feel broken and shattered and worthless because something's always going wrong in one of these five areas. Are they not? That's the reason you feel so tired. But when you find your identity in Jesus Christ and who Jesus Christ created you to be, those things, they're just things you encounter during the day. And they don't bring stress. They bring joy. Fourth question I have is, am I thankful? Which is very important for a woman to ask. <laughs> I, one morning I got up, Lucretia and I used to live in a house where we didn't have a garage. And so we both parked our cars outside. Now we have a garage. And I still park my car outside. She parks hers in the garage. And so I went out one morning, and I was scraping my windshield. You know how you scrape your windshield, the windshield scraper thing? I scraped my windshield, and after I scraped my windshield, I, I looked at her car, and I just kind of felt the Holy Spirit say to me, scrape her windshield. I was like, well, I, don't, I don't know if that's God. God tells you to do things like, go for the gold. And, and, and God didn't tell you to scrape the windshield. And I was like, well, I just don't know. And I felt so convicted, like I should really scrape her windshield. So I got the windshield scraper out. I scraped her windshield. Didn't think anything about it. That night we're having supper. Lucretia looks at me and she said, can I say something to you? And I'm like, oh, man. Because I knew I messed up. I always do that. And I said, sure. And she said, um, I just wanted to really thank you for scraping my windshield this morning. That showed me that you care about me. And that meant a lot to me. Thanks. Do you know that since that day, I have scraped her windshield. I'm a windshield scraping machine. Even if she didn't have to go to work, I'd scrape her windshield and tell her about it. Scrape your windshield. You know what, ladies? You would be amazed at what saying thank you will do for your husband. You'd be amazed. Because the Bible says this in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, about... It says, always giving, thanks in, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, there should be overflowing of thanksgiving. Now, let me tell you why this is dangerous, ladies. Let me tell you why this broken, busted vase is dangerous. Let me tell you why. Because a woman who feels like this also feels like everything is owed to her, and she has a sense of entitlement, so she will never thank her husband for anything because he owed me that. But a woman who feels valued and priceless in the sight of God realizes that her husband works hard. And she can say, thank you. Say thank you. Don't, ladies, if he tries to help around the house, if you get him that far, like don't follow him and tell him everything he's doing wrong. Oh, you're, you're putting that wrong. Oh, you're putting that wrong. Oh, don't, don't do that. Oh, you don't know. You don't use furniture. Oh, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you put the... No, just stop it. And, 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 and he doesn't feel encouraged. Just thank him. One time I, I put the dishes up for Lucretia. N nothing went. I, I put them all up in the wrong place. Bowls in the refrigerator. You know, I just messed it up. And she comes in and she goes, Perry, 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 um, thank you 
so much for um, emptying the dishwasher. But um, from now on, I, 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 I like doing that. And you don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Some of the guys are going, that's how you get out of it right there. You see what I'm saying? She told me thank you, but she didn't tell me how stupid I was. Here, here's another thing, ladies. Teach your children how to thank their father. Don't let your kids grow up thinking their dad owes them everything. Teach your children, hey, tell your dad thanks. Tell your dad thanks for supper tonight. You know, you go out to the restaurant. Tell your dad thanks for supper tonight. Tell your dad thanks for this. Tell your dad. Th- teach your children, model for your children how to thank their father. Because if they learn from you to thank their, er- their earthly father, they will have no problem expressing thanks to their heavenly father. Because they won't grow up thinking God owes them something. Ladies, God doesn't want this right here for you. And my prayer, ladies, is not that you'll leave here feeling beat up and invaluable. It's that, like, you'll let God clean you up a little bit. But one thing I love about Jesus all through Scripture is anything that's ever a mess, he made it right. And there may be some ladies here this morning, you feel like this broken glass. But the cool thing is about Jesus that he can clean you up. Oh, it might not be pretty, but he can clean you up and reshape you and reform you. And I don't think he necessarily wants to put those pieces back together. He wants you to be who he originally created you to be, beautiful, Christ-like, unique. Ladies, this is who you were called and created to be. This is the kind of woman that you should aspire to become. Is it happening? Let's pray. Jesus, you are the one true living God. and You reign supreme. Jesus, right now I ask you to speak to the hearts of the ladies that are here. Jesus, that we could, that I just pray a blessing over these women that they could learn to stop looking at appearance and house and kids and all the things that the world says defines them as a woman. And Jesus, they would look to you and let you and scripture and your spirit define the role of biblical womanhood. Jesus, that the ladies here this morning would learn to completely Turn their eyes on you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Ladies, I'm just going to ask you during this next few moments to reflect. Is there anything in your life that needs to change? Is there anything you need to specifically pray for? Just like we did for the men last week. This week the altar is open if you want to come forward and pray. If you want to ask your husband, will you pray for me? Can we go down there? Will you pray for me to be the kind of woman that Jesus wants me to be. Will you pray for me that I'll stop obsessing about this? Or will you pray for me that I'll stop obsessing about that? You can come forward at the altar. You can do it right where you sit. But ladies, as Megan sings, it's my prayer that the words of her song would be the cry of your heart. And we would truly learn to turn our eyes on Jesus Christ.